Okay, this video is about chords and arcs and circles. We've got two objectives. One is to be able to use congruent chords, congruent arcs, and central angles, and how do those kind of tie together? And then we're going to finish up by talking about how do you use perpendicular bisectors to a chord. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to define what is a chord. Well, a chord is any segment that goes from one side of the circle to the other. So for example, this would be chord AB. All right, it goes from one side of the circle to the other. So test yourself here. What do you think is the largest chord that can occur in a circle? And hopefully you all recognize the largest chord that could exist would be a diameter. All right. So we've got some theorems involving a chord that we need to pay attention to. You want to organize your thinking, synthesize your notes, so that based on the scenario, you know what mathematical approach to take. Here's the first thing that says, within a circle or in congruent circles, congruent central angles have congruent arcs. Conversely, congruent arcs have congruent central angles. So let's kind of sketch this scenario here. So if that's the center of the, the circle, and let's say that I have this, we'll call this point O, and let's say that I have arc AB, or angle AOB. And then somewhere else in the circle, I have another angle that gets created, another central angle, that gets created here. And we call this, let's see, we'll call that C and D. All right. Here's what this theorem is telling me. This theorem is saying is if you know that angle AOB is congruent to angle DOC. Angle AOB congruent to angle DOC. If you know that to be true, then I can conclude that their corresponding arcs must also be congruent. So I could say that arc AB must be congruent to arc DC, or we could even call it CD. All right? So if the central angles are congruent, then their corresponding arcs are congruent. Second theorem here, theorem 12.5. Within a circle or in congruent circles, congruent central angles have congruent chords. All right? So let's take a look at that. Let's try to draw a similar scenario here. So let's say that I have this angle. Call that O. Again, we'll call that A and B. And let's say that I have this angle here. Um, we'll call this C. All right. And what I created here were the two angles, angle A, O, B. And let's go ahead and conclude that they are, because that's part of the given here, that those angles are congruent. All right, so angle B, O, C. All right, now if those two angles are congruent, the previous theorem just told us that the arcs must be congruent. Arc AB is congruent to arc BC. But this theorem says that they have what's called congruent chords. And the congruent chords are going to be the chords that connect those endpoints of the arcs. So what this theorem allows us to say is this theorem allows us to say is if this is true, if you have congruent central angles, then I'm able to conclude that segment AB must be congruent to segment BC. All right. Conversely, if I knew that those chords were congruent, so in other words, if I told you that segment AB was congruent to segment BC, you now also know by this theorem that those central angles have to be congruent. So there's a lot of kind of backwards and forwards here. We just have to make sure that we stay within what the theorems tell us. So let's take a look at this third one here. Within a circle or in congruent circle, congruent chords have congruent arcs. Congru conversely, congruent arcs have congruent chords, all right? So let's kind of take a look at that. Let's say, for example, 
that I have chord AB. And somewhere else in the circle, I have another chord, and let's call it CD. Now this theorem says, if I read it straight through, that if AB is congruent to CD, if the chords are congruent, then we can conclude that their arcs also must be congruent. Conversely, if I know that the arcs are congruent, I can say that the segments are congruent. Hopefully you guys are starting to see the bigger picture here and how central angles relate to corresponding arcs relate to congruent or to their segments, their chords. All right. Now we have one final one here that we're going to look at, and then we're going to look at some problems. Within a circle or incongruent circle, chords that are equidistant from the center or centers are congruent. All right, so let's say that I have chord AB. And let's say over on this side of the circle, I have chord CD. All right, and there's the center. Now, how I would measure from the center to one of those chords is by figuring out the perpendicular. Okay. So I'm going to call this, let's see, we'll call that point E, and then the perpendicular here, and we'll call that point F. All right, so here's what I know to be true. If OE is congruent to OF, all right, in other words, if the distance from the center to the chords is the same then I can conclude that the chords themselves, all right, the first one, that's AB up there, that segment AB must be congruent to segment CD. And if the chords are congruent, then their arcs are congruent. You kind of start to hopefully see the bigger picture here. All right, so let's take a look at some of these problems and see how this is going to be a plot. First thing when I recognize, what I recognize right away here, all right, is I notice that both the segment down on the bottom here and the segment going up the right side there, I notice that both of those are equidistant from the center. I know that their distance from the center here is 5. So that relates me to that last theorem that we talked about. I know that, that chord, both the chords have to be congruent. Now, because they tell me that these two pieces of the chord must be congruent, I'm able to simply conclude that x has to be 14. How did I figure that out? 7 plus 7 is 14. Because the chords are equidistant from the center, the chords have to be congruent. All right. So taking a look at this picture right here, I notice that the chord on top is 15. I notice that the segments of that chord are identical to the segments on the bottom chord which tells me the chord on the bottom is also 15. If the chords themselves are congruent, then the chords must be equidistant from the center, which very simply tells me x is equal to 8. If you think about these problems so far, guys, hopefully one thing you're recognizing is I really got to understand the theorems. The theorems are going to lead me right to the correct answer. But the theorems are what lead you, not an algebraic type of scenario. Not saying algebra can't be in there as well. So take a look at this one. I noticed that this segment right here is 3.5, and it's congruent to this segment. So this segment is also 3.5. I noticed that they are equidistant from the center. All right? If they're equidistant from the center, <clears throat> then I know that the chords have to be congruent. If that left side of the chord is 5, this right side of the chord is 5, and therefore I can conclude that the other chord must be 10. All right, let's take, it some more, take a look at some more theorems that have to do with the circle. All right, and it says, in a circle, if a diameter is perpendicular to a chord, if a diameter is perpendicular to a chord, then it bisects the chord and its arc. Okay. 
So let's start off with a chord. Let's say that we have this chord right here, AB. And here's the center of our circle. So now what I'm going to do is draw a, a perpendicular, or sorry, a diameter here as best I can. Right? Now this creates C and D. We'll call that center O. All right. So here's what this theorem says. If this diameter, which I'm, I can call that CD, if CD is perpendicular to AB, all right, then what I know I can deduce from that then is that AD must be congruent to DB. Those two sections of the chord must be congruent there and there. And I also can conclude that the corresponding arcs must also be congruent. Arc AC must be congruent to arc BC. Okay? The next theorem, 12.9 says, if a diameter bisects a chord, and that chord is not a diameter, then it must be perpendicular to the chord. All right? So if I have a diameter here, let's sketch a diameter. All right? And that diameter bisects a chord. So in other words, I tell you that that's true. Let's give some names here. A, B, C, O. Okay. All right. What I am able to conclude here is that B, O, the diameter, must be perpendicular to A, C. All right. If I see that a chord is being bisected, then I know this diameter must be perpendicular to this chord. That's what that theorem tells me. Next theorem says, if you got a perpendicular bisector of a chord, then that has to fall on the diameter. I paraphrased what that says here, guys. But if I have something like this, if I have segment AB, there's my chord. And I draw the perpendicular bisector of that chord. Let's say that's it. The perpendicular bisector of that chord, and we'll call it C. Okay. Then what I am I know very simply is this. That OC must be a diameter. And the way that they phrase it is that, that that perpendicular bisector, that diameter that we're speaking of, must contain the center of the circle. All right? So let's see what this leads us to in this first example here. All right. I notice that I have a diameter of 20. I notice that I have a chord that is 16. And I see this segment that goes from the center to the chord. All right? When that segment occurs and it is perpendicular, it's actually bisecting this chord. This creates for me a little triangle here. So I'm trying to sketch this as best I can. A little triangle here where I know that this piece is 8, half of 16. I know this piece is X, what they name as X in the problem. And I know that this piece over here is 10. And from this scenario, they want me to figure out what is that distance from the center to the chord. We look at it as, by using the Pythagorean theorem, how do I find that measurement? All right. They also tell us to round to the nearest tenth. So I know to do the Pythagorean theorem, we always start with the hypotenuse squared. That's equal to x squared plus 8 squared, or 100 is equal to x squared plus 64. Subtract the 64, I get 36 is equal to x squared, and I can conclude that x has to equal 6. So now we're bringing in a little bit more algebra, all right, Pythagorean theorem, in with these theorems about the circles. Again, remember, I want you guys to have like a, a note page 
that has what these theorems are telling you. That's going to make some of the work you have to do and the test that you have to take on this stuff easier when you have that reference. All right, let's take a look at the next picture. Well, in this next picture, here's what I know. I have this little triangle right here. All right. I know this is 3.6. I know that's a right angle. Now, because the whole chord is 8, I'm able to deduce, because that chord is being bisected, that this side must be 4. All right. If you noticed, I just kind of assumed another line right there. Well, here's the one thing I know to be true. In any circle, all radii must be congruent. Where x is in the problem is a radius. This little segment that I created to become the hypotenuse of that triangle is also a radius. So then I'm able to deduce that x squared has to be 3.6 squared plus 4 squared. All right, I'm going to use my calculator here to help me out. I've got 3.6 squared plus 4 squared, and that's 28.96. Let me write that down. X squared is equal to 28.96. Now I need to round. I round when they ask me to round. I'm going to take the square root of it and round to the nearest tenth, and that would give me 5.4 units. All right, let's take a look at this scenario, all right, to finish it out. Now, in this particular problem, I'm looking at it, and one thing that I notice here is that X is the measurement of the chord. So the triangle that I'm looking at here kind of looks something like this. But then what is the measurement of that chord? Well, that's going to be X divided by 2, or 1 half X. Either way is fine. Pythagorean theorem says 12 squared equals x over 2 squared plus 6 squared. So this would be 144 is equal to x squared over 4. I squared both the top and the bottom. Plus 36. All right. I'm going to take 36 and subtract it. So that gives me 108 is equal to x squared over 4. To get rid of a divided by 4, I multiply by 4. So let's go ahead and just check myself. 4 times 108. It's going to give me 432. So x squared is equal to 432. Square root 432. And that gives me 20.8 rounded to the nearest tenth. Again, I only round when they ask me to. Make sure on Math Excel you're paying attention to how they want you to round. I know some of you guys had difficulty on that with that on the last test. Good luck. Let me know how I can help.